Okay, video one, chapter one, basic notions of logic in the logic book. Uh, just a note, if you go buy this online, do not buy it new or you'll pay through the nose like $50 or some crazy thing. Uh, definitely just go to Abe Books or Amazon and get the cheapest used copy. This is a text in deductive logic, more specifically in symbolic deductive logic. Chapters 1 through 5 are devoted to sentential logic, that branch of symbolic deductive logic that takes sentences as the fundamental unit of logical analysis. Sentences that me and you talk in, English sentences. Chapters 7 through 10 are devoted to predicate logic, that branch of symbolic deductive logic that takes predicates and individual terms to be the fundamental units of logical analysis. I know all that's just way out there, but if we go through all these chapters together, you'll see what all this means. Chapter 6 is devoted to the meta-theory of sentential logic, and chapter 11 to the meta-theory of predicate logic. Okay, coming down a little ways here, it starts talking about Euclid. Um, and it talks about Euclid's axioms in geometry. Uh, Euclid, circa 300 BC, may have been the first person to develop a reasonably complete axiomatic system. Axiomatic systems start with a relatively small number of assumptions, definitions, postulates, and provide a way of deducing from there the rest of the discipline being axiomatized, in Euclid's case, geometry. Through the centuries, scholars have attempted to produce axiomatic systems for a wide variety of disciplines, ranging from plane and solid geometry to arithmetic, which was successfully axiomatized by Giuseppe Piano in 1889. Interesting, it was that late. G-I-U-S-E-P-P-E, -E -E, right, that's the first name, P-E-A-N-O, in 1889, the axiomatization of arithmetic. Now, about the same time that Euclid was developing his axiomatic treatment of plane geometry, Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC in Greece, was developing a general system of logic intended to incorporate the basic principles of good reasoning and to provide a way of evaluating specific cases of reasoning. So he wanted to take it out of being just this floating art form and to put it down on paper and make it a science. And he did that. The system Aristotle produced is variously known as syllogistic, traditional, or Aristotelian logic. Predecessors of Aristotle in the Greek world and elsewhere were interested in reasoning well, in offering cogent arguments for their theses and theories, and in identifying flaws and fallacies in their own and in other people's reasoning. But Aristotle appears to be the first person in the Western world to offer at least the outlines of a comprehensive system for codifying and evaluating a very wide range of arguments and reasonings. So now let's go into an example. The following is an example of Aristotelian syllogism. All mammals are vertebrates. Some sea creatures are mammals. Therefore, some sea creatures are vertebrates. Makes perfect logical sense, but the first one to tell us that was Aristotle. Another example, all cardiologists are rich. Some doctors are cardiologists. Some doctors are rich. Aristotelian logic is a variety of deductive symbolic logic. It is symbolic because it analyzes reasoning by identifying the form or structure of good reasoning, independent of the specific content of particular instances of such reasoning. Aristotelian logic is very powerful. During the centuries following Aristotle, the rules and techniques associated with syllogistic logic were refined and various test procedures developed by Roman, Arabic, medieval, and modern logicians. Until late in the 19th century, Aristotelian logic remained predominant system for formalizing and evaluating reasoning. It is still taught today in many introductory courses. Nonetheless, there are important drawbacks to Aristotelian logic. Syllogisms are at the heart of Aristotelian lo logic, and each syllogism must have exactly two premises and a conclusion. Moreover, every sentence of a syllogism must be of one of the four following forms. All A's are B's, no A's are B's, some A's are B's, some A's are not B's. That's Aristotelian logic is thus best suited to reasoning about relations among groups 
all members of this group are members of that group, some members of this group are members of that group, and so on. Aristotelian logic thus has to strain to handle reasoning about individuals. For example, Socrates is human, must be recast as something like all things that are Socrates, there is, we assume, only one, are things that are human. The Aristotelian requirement that every conclusion be drawn from just two premises is unduly restrictive and does not mirror the complexity of actual reason, reasoning and argumentation, a single instance of which may make use of a very large number of premises. To sum up, reasoning that relies on relations see chapter 7 for an explanation of relations cannot readily be accommodated within Aristotelian logic. As an example, the reasoning, quote, Sarah is taller than Tom, and Tom is taller than Betty, therefore Sarah is taller than Betty, presupposes the transitivity of the taller than relation. That is, it presupposes the truth that, for any three things, if the first is taller than the second, and the second is taller than the third, then the first is taller than the third. Principles such as the above and arguments relying on them cannot be incorporated with the Aristotelian framework in any intuitive way. So for these and other reasons, logicians in the mid-1800s and the late-1800s looked for alt alternatives to Aristotelian logic. This work involved the development of systems of sentential logic, that is, systems based on the way sentences of natural languages can be generated from other sentences by the use of such expressions as or, and, if, then, and not. Let us consider an example. Karen is either in Paris or in Nairobi. She is not in Nairobi. Therefore, Karen is in Paris. Simple arguments such as the above are not readily represented within syllogistic logic. Yet the above argument is clearly an example of good reasoning. Whenever the first two sentences are true, the last, sentences, the last sentence is also true. Reasoning of this sort can readily be symbolized in systems of sentential logic. On the other hand, sentential logics are not easily able to deal with reasoning that rests on claims about all, some, or none of this sort of thing being of that sort of thing, the sort of claims Aristotelian logic can often handle. Predicate logic incorporates sentential logic and is also able to handle all the kinds of sentences that are expressible in Aristotelian syllogisms, as well as those that pose difficulties for Aristotelian logic. So predicate logic is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, and that's the one that we learn way later in chapter 8 and 9. Now to get our motivation on the table, why study logic? Why would you be interested in this course on formal logic? There are a variety of reasons for studying logic. It's a well-developed discipline that some find interesting in its own right. That's particularly my uh, reason for studying it. A discipline that includes a rich history and many current research programs. Certainly anyone who plans to major in either philosophy or math or to do graduate work in either should have a solid grounding in symbolic logic. So if you're into math or uh, a major in philosophy, logic's going to be necessary. The study of formal logic also helps develop the skills needed to present and evaluate arguments. Another reason for studying symbolic logic, uh, formal logic that is, is to do better on tests if you're in college, to do better on, because just being able to sort out, to group, break this sentence down, and say what's his logical implications. And when you're able to think logically, in a formally logically way, you're able to break down test questions, and I've actually found grammatically incorrect and ambiguous test questions on professors' uh, exams, which is no big deal that happens, but uh, it's sometimes when you're in college and you take four or five finals uh, this semester, it's good to be able to think clearly about the sentences the professor's putting out there. So that's a reason for it. Also, if you're into mathematics or science, it's good to know it. Computer languages are nothing but logic. It's just systems of logical commands. Writing a computer language and then doing you know, commands within the computer language. If this, then this. This, if and only if this. If not this, then this. If this, then not this. So on and so 